Welcome to Anthrodish, the weekly show about food, culture, and identity. I'm your host, Sarah Dugnan. Today is episode 10, and I am very excited about it because not only is it episode 10, but we also have the award-winning writer and journalist Trina Moyles on. Uh, Trina has a passion for telling stories about social justice and environmental issues. Her first book is called Women Who Dig, Farming, Feminism, and the Fight to Feed the World, and it was released this past March of 2018. The book has been receiving praise and was described by author Raj Patel as haunting, powerful, and important. She's worked intimately with rural organizations and communities for the past 10 years, spanning from Nicaragua, Guatemala, Cuba, Canada, and East Africa, uh, collaborating on human rights and grassroots development projects across these nations. Her writing, both narrative, nonfiction, and journalism, have been extensively published in places like The Globe and Mail, Alberta Views, Swerve, Motherboard, Guts Canadian Feminist Magazine, Modern Farmer, and so many more. I came across Trina's book and uh, her writing through a listserv for the Canadian Food Studies Association, which if you don't follow, I highly recommend. Um, But the moment that I read her work, I just had to have her come on Anthrodish to share her research and her experiences. Today we talk about her book, Women Who Dig, and we talk about the research that inspired it. Trina explores what it means to be a farmer and who has or hasn't been traditionally considered a farmer across the world the varied ways in which feminism has shaped farming and day-to-day life for women, and the ways resiliency may help shape the future of farming with increasing threats of climate change across the world. I absolutely adored reading Trina's book, and I am super excited to share this interview with you all, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. How are you doing today, Trina? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, so before we get into some of your work and your research, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what brought you into journalism or writing more generally? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I grew up in a small town in northwestern Alberta called Peace River. Um, it's a farming community, although I didn't grow up on a farm. Many of our friends and um, uh, like family friends were, were farmers though. And so I spent a lot of time wanting to be a farm kid and horseback riding and, uh, dreaming of what that would be like. Um, but lived in town. I was a town kid. Um, but lived very close to the land. Um, it being a small community. I went to school in Edmonton. I, uh, focused my undergraduate degree in, uh, cultural anthropology actually. Oh, cool. Um, with an English minor. Yeah. So it kind of fit together my um, interest, I guess, in travel and uh, working with different cultures. Um, and then also, you know, with the literary focus as well, too. So that was my undergraduate. And um, I had the chance to work with actually a really cool professor in my uh, fourth year and looking at um, the anthropology of development, because my other passion uh with extracurricular activities was working in uh, human rights related activities. Yes. Um, so it was really neat to apply um, an anthropological lens to looking at international development, um, uh, sort of like best practices of, of uh, what works, what hasn't worked historically, mm-hmm. uh, what we could actually call like colonialism as opposed to um, community led development. Um, so I really benefited from that. Uh, but I really feel like I got my foot in the door um, through uh, professional experiences. So I was really lucky to start working with a great uh, small grassroots organization in Edmonton called Change for Children Association. Um, And I was in my early 20s when I started with them uh, working on a program called Rural Roots. So it was focused on uh, social justice education for um, high school students primarily in rural Alberta who wouldn't typically access um, resources um, around uh, global development. Now a lot of that has changed. Now they've built global globalization into the curriculum. But at, at the time, a lot of that content was missing. So it was a really neat thing to be a part of. Change for Children also had a focus internationally, a huge focus, focus internationally, actually, um, with a lot of their work focused on food security and potable water, uh, uh, gender equality and education. So I had a fantastic opportunity to learn from um, my colleagues and my supervisors um, around their experiences uh, working primarily in Latin America. Um, and, and through that organization, I began working internationally myself too, 
uh, in very much like a, a learning role and a learning capacity um, with, uh, I've always been sort of a natural writer. And so through that work, I would document a lot of stories of uh, how development projects had um, benefited people's lives, some of the challenges that families still faced. Um, and so, yeah, over the course of 10 years, I really worked in, in that sector of international development. Um, and in 2013, I found myself, I'd moved to uh, Uganda to actually just volunteer for a few months oh, nice. um, with, uh, yeah, with a healthcare organization. Um, but they took a really a, a holistic approach to health, recognizing that, A, a lot of the, the, the people that they served in, and this was in Uganda, a town called Kabali. Um, and that a lot of the clientele they served were farmers, subsistence pri- farmers primarily, or small scale, really. Um, not a lot of people practicing larger scale agriculture. Um, so I actually came on board and, and helped out with some communication activities around this really cool rabbit breeding um, project in Uganda. Um, and rabbits was a really neat thing, although it was not necessarily part of the culture or the traditional, um, like a traditional farming activity, but rabbits make a lot of sense because. Uh, they're small animal. They can be kept in uh, elevated cages. Um, it didn't cost people a lot of money to, to access food for rabbits because they could harvest wild greens. Um, and rabbits, you know, the expression "breed like rabbits." Yeah. <laughs> Procreate. It's crazy. a good, uh, <laughs> yeah, turnaround activity. So, um, so they were able to generate a protein source, a really low resource, low cost protein source. Um, yeah, for uh, uh, so, anyways, I was a part of that project for a while, and my time in Uganda kind of Uganda um, went from three months to actually three years. Oh, I nice. <laughs> loved the yeah, I loved the work so much, um, and the work nat- naturally. I was working with women, a lot of women farmers, um, and my Ugandan colleagues, uh, you know, would translate for me, and I just began to learn so much from these women and be really impressed with their work ethic and all of the challenges they were up against. So the book was really born in Uganda through that um, position. And after my first year there, that's when I got the idea to to actually work on the book. So, um, yeah, so that's a little bit about my background. I've always been a writer, but I um, I think I needed a passion. Like I needed something to write about. And so yeah. through all this other experience I've had in my life, it just made sense for that to be the focus on um, on women farmers and a way to connect my experiences in Latin America um, with Change for Children Association and then also in Uganda. So yeah, that's really where it began. That's so fascinating because I'm also someone who I started out in English lit and then I moved into anthropology. Um, so the writing and anthro connection makes sense to me, but I've always kind of wondered... You know, I find with anthropology textbooks, they can be a little bit dry sometimes, and you have that natural ability to write in a way that's really beautiful, but you're also informative at the same time. So it all kind of makes sense bringing those those different worlds together in your writing. Yeah, I think it's such a, like, narrative can be such a powerful form of sharing information, and I think we're seeing that more and more in academia, recognizing that. Um, that's always what appealed to me about anthropology. And the, the, the methodology approach, too, of spending such concentrated periods of time with people as opposed to, you know, just doing a survey here, a survey there. Like I remember my one anthro prof who really left a print impression on me. He said, you know, you can't go by what people say. It's what people do in practice. So you have to spend time with people in order to, um, to, I don't know, uncover the truth or (laughs) find, find the deeper stories, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So when you were traveling and I know we'll explore this um, a little bit later as well, but did you, uh, stay with these women and with these communities through different seasons, or did you kind of move around as your schedule dictated? Um, I had the advantage, I mean, living in Uganda at the time, I, to me, the, the Ugandan chapter is one of my favorites, and I think one of the strongest. I think it's because, obviously, my knowledge base is so much uh, richer there because I had the benefit of being there for three years. Yeah. But I actually lived in town. I was a, I was a, a town lady <laughs> as opposed to... <laughs> Actually, living in the rural communities um, where uh, where the majority of the women who I interviewed actually lived, uh, and getting to those communities could be quite the ordeal. Um, I worked with one of my fantastic colleagues, uh, Lillian Camusine, and she's a sort of this Jane of all trades 
She uh, does community tourism. She uh, works for like PhD students who come to do their research in Uganda. Um, uh, she's worked as a social worker and a teacher, just really terrific. And our uh, worlds collided in Uganda. And so she actually um, was a huge part of the research there. And we would hire a Boda Boda, which is uh, like a motorcycle taxi. So the the driver, myself and Lillian, would be sandwiched onto this motorcycle. And wow. um, the villages are so concentrated in Uganda because there's such a dense population for such a small land base. Um, and uh, but this particular part of Uganda was called the Switzerland of Africa. I think people tend oh. to think of Africa so flat and hot and um, not at all in, in this area. It was very uh, like a uh, sort of a volcanic um, foothill range and. So we'd be going up and down these hills, and um, it was quite the adventure getting to the communities. Um, and it made me appreciate, too, because that's, you know, the, that distance and that type of terrain is one of the huge barriers for women getting their, their product to the to market. Um, so getting to the communities definitely helps me appreciate, uh, gain a lens on, on what women were facing in terms of distance and geography. Um, but I, I, yeah, I was lucky in Uganda. I was there for all seasons. Um, so rainy season, dry season to experience different challenges and, um, kind of see how, uh, their lives would change according to the season. In some of the other countries, I didn't really have that advantage. Um, but I had spent so much time in, in Central America and that's why I wanted to go back there to, to a few communities that I already had really kind of deep roots in. Um, so I feel like my lens is wider there. In India, I didn't have the advantage of having um, much of a, a, a long-term relationship with the community that I went to uh, to visit, uh, but still the people I worked with and the organization I worked with were hugely helpful. So it kind of differed country to country, but mm-hmm. definitely my heart. Like the book was born in Uganda, and, uh, and that's where I feel like um, – I don't know. That's where I feel like the story is really sunk in in a much, like, much deeper way for me. Beautiful. Um, so I'm wondering too, in terms of like how, and you spoke a little bit about this, but in terms of how you picked countries, was it a very organic process for you in terms of just where you wanted to travel or who you knew in those countries? Or did you have an intention when you picked each uh, region that you're going to focus on? I'd like to say that I had an intention for each <laughs> region, <laughs> but I think it also came down to two, like, um, just financial, like uh, where I could afford to get to, um, <laughs> or logistical, like where can I, where can I, I mean, can you take a little bit of a risk when you go to a community you've never been to before? And, oh. and again, that's what I love about like my anthropological roots is I feel like you want that, you want that genuine connection with the communities. You don't want to just show up and launch into interviews. Um, and you're not even really sure if the content that people are delivering you is actually the real story, right? So mm. as much as possible, I tried to work in places where I'd already been. And I had that uh, advantage in, in Guatemala and uh, Nicaragua as well of, of having kind of long-term relationships with the organizations and communities there. Um, in India, I didn't. It was a little bit of a gamble, but I really wanted to get there because, um, A, I mean, uh, I think like well over 60% of the uh, population, uh, sorry, 60% of the farmers tend to be women. It's a, a huge concentration of female farmers mm-hmm. and all sorts of uh, really interesting issues um, uh, there. And so I really, and I read a lot by um, a wonderful writer, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Oh my gosh, and yes. she's <laughs> Yeah. She's wonderful. <laughs> and she, oh yeah. And I mean, she's like, she's really the one who, who pushed a lot of these ideas and planted a lot the seeds for this book, I think in so many ways. I just respect her writing so, so much and her focus on small scale um, peasant agriculture and typically led Farms led by uh, by women, um, and and so that was a huge passion for me to get to India, and uh, I I got a small I think I won like a writing contest or write or like an essay award or nice. something, and that enabled me to travel from Uganda to to India. Um, I really didn't have a ton of <laughs> resources to fund my travel, so it kind of came as I would like scrape together the funds, really. Um, There's so many places I would have loved to have gone. It would have been great to get to like Japan or somewhere in Europe would have been really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, 
And then I actually also wish I would have um, included more stories from Indigenous farmers in Canada, uh, looking at uh, Indigenous agricultural practices on the land would have been really neat. So there was no shortage of stories, but I think it came down to, I did want it to be sort of uh, geographical, but it came down to resources and uh, connections to look for sort of genuine research opportunities, I guess. Fair, but I appreciate the scrappiness in your story. Like it's so, you know, when it comes together, it's such a beautiful, cohesive story. But I love, I always love hearing about researchers, you know, trying to figure out how they're going to afford to get from one location to the next and like the reality underneath the narrative that they're creating. Yeah, and there's this like one one thing that I kind of love, like the last story that fell into place and was not supposed to be in the book was um, actually from uh, farmers in my own community in Peace mm-hmm. River. So I just laughed that I had traveled all over the world, you know, like uh, seeking out these stories. <laughs> and then um, I had some content that wasn't able to be used in the book last minute. And I thought I needed like a filler, like I need a filler story. And it ended up uh, reconnecting with some people that I already knew. And I don't know why it is sometimes when you, maybe when you're so focused on travel, you overlook the stories in your own backyard. But yeah. um, that was kind of a beautiful little last minute uh, uh, thing that, that came into the book. So I interviewed uh, three women at a farm called Nature's Way, just outside of Peace River, Alberta, and it was perfect. Like it was, it just all came together. Oh, I love that, and I do. It's so. It's yeah. You never really appreciate your roots until you start exploring the world. I find like that's when you kind of appreciate the the culture around you that you grew up with or that you kind of take for granted in that sense. Yeah, you you come back to it with new eyes. I think a new perspective, and yeah, yeah, I definitely appreciate that. Nice. Um, Okay, so I want to back up a little bit and explore the idea of who can be a farmer. So traditionally, do you find that that who uh, changes in different global contexts or do you see similar patterns across cultures? So who is a farmer and who isn't a farmer typically? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think there's more similarities uh, than differences, to be honest. Um, And initially, when I asked myself that question, I always think of the, I mean, what I grew up with was, was like sort of the Farmer Joe archetypes that you'd see on like CTV or CBC or I don't know, like they would run these sort of like, what's it like on a dairy farm, you know, and you envision the, uh, or maybe it's even kind of like a cartoon kind of archetype of, you know, the, the man, kind of the paunch belly and overall, gene overalls, and he's got some grass between his teeth and um, as someone who was not a farm kid, <laughs> that's always the first kind of image that would come to mind is, is farmer Joe. Um, and I thought, no, you know, there's no way, there's no way that people can still like, that's still the thing that we associate. But, you know, I've talked to young female farmers, Canadian farmers, for example, who go to the farmer's markets and they'll have, you know, people come by their booth and appreciate the produce or whatever it is they're selling. And then people will ask, great, can you pass on my gratitude to the farmer? Oh or where's the farmer? You know, yeah, and they're like, I'm not the farmer's wife or the farmer's daughter. Like, I am the farmer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and I just, I mean, I think that story is, is, is very fitting. Like, who can be a farmer? Who do we, who does society see as a farmer do? And yet, what's the dynamic with within the farm communities themselves? Um, often I'm told, like, it's in a Canadian context that, of course, you know, we recognize women as farmers as well within farm communities. Um, but who's making the decisions? There's more question we can unpack that. Who's making the decisions on the farm? Mm-hmm. Who plant? Um, who knows how to use all of the equipment on the farm? Um, who will inherit the farm, son or daughter? Um, and, you know, in patriarchal societies, often land would, I mean, land would go from father to son. I interviewed one woman in uh, Edmonton who now works in food security, uh, the post-secondary level, doing research, and and she wants to be a farmer. And this is the 1970s, and her father told her, "No, no daughter of mine will ever farm. So wow. if you want to be a farmer, you you need to marry into land." And I think that's that's like the big story right there. And that is something that does have, um, like that's a uh, I think a global story as well too. Um, how do we access land? I mean, I think the um, so according to the United Nations, uh, women own approximately only 20% of the world's arable farmland. Wow. Um, yeah, which is a huge, huge gender disparity. Um, yeah. In Uganda, women would have to uh, to marry into land. Um, and if you didn't have land, they'd say, oh, you're not considered a woman. So, um, And with a you know, the population that's like primarily women are engaged in subsistence to small 
scale agriculture, accessing land is, is, is life. It's, it's your, it's your security. So therefore, you know, you, you do need to find a husband who has land. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. And actually the, the word, the, the title of the book, Women Who Dig was actually born in Uganda. So the women in the Ruchiga dialect, um, were called Abahinji Mukazi, which means literally it translates to women who dig. But it doesn't mean farmer. There's another word for mm-hmm. farmer. And I would ask them, well, why aren't you called that word? And it didn't necessarily have a gen- gender connotation direct or a linguistic gender um, connection. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, the word tended to be used for um, larger scale agriculture, um, people growing cash crops, uh, accessing tractors, using maybe um, market spot in the or pesticides or fertilizers bought in the seed. And yes, those farmers tended to be men who had that um, amount of capital to invest in their farming. So I just thought that was a real um, interesting, just an interesting observation, uh, particularly because women were really driving, you know, uh, um, growing food crops, um, directly feeding families and communities, um, and a huge population. Like I think over 65% of the uh, population uh, um, were of women were subsistence to small scale farmers. So really driving food security in that region, and yet not getting any of the credit or yeah. societal recognition for their work. Even when I came to ask them, you know, like I want to interview about your work, they were sort of like, "Why?" <laughs> like, what is, what are we doing that's, you know, interesting? And maybe that's just the curse of, like, that's, I think everyone can kind of relate to that. Like, you know, if I, we live such ordinary existences. So like, what what could, what about my life interests you? But then when I would get them talking in, in the interviews, especially the group interviews, those were a lot of fun because women kind of fed off of each other. Amazing. Um, yeah, I think they, they started to feel... Like every woman I, I interviewed, no matter how difficult like her situation or the barriers uh, she was up against, really expressed to me this incredible pride for their work uh, and love. Like love is the right word to use. Um, just this passion for being farmers. And it not that's not to romanticize, I think, the situation. And I really don't feel like I think a lot of them were very aware of the sort of economic or cultural uh, sort of injustices that they faced as women farmers. but really were very uh, proud of their work and you know it's farming so tangible you get to see the you know the direct result especially for women because women tend to be small-scale farmers so their their crop is usually uh, going directly to the community as opposed to traveling long distances so there was this enormous pride that I witnessed um, but yeah the women are not often given the credit as farmers even my uh, one of my close friends who's an urban farmer in Calgary said initially she was reluctant to use the word. She was, she was like, it's like that, saying the F word. Oh my I was gosh. like, why? But you're growing food for a living. You know, you get to call yourself a farmer, but I think it's because, um, yeah, farmers attached to this idea that we have often of these very large scale operations. Um, and I have read like, uh, on a few of my articles that have come out on CBC, I've read some of the comments, which they say you're never supposed to do. Oh my gosh. It's yeah. really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn a lot. And there was these like a rate male farmers from the Canadian prairies who were basically like, you know, like these women don't get to call themselves farmers. Like they don't have, you know, like we don't, we've got millions of acres of land and they've got like half an acre or not even. Right. And th- those, that's what we call hobby farmers or gardeners. Right. Oh my like, gosh. Well, we need all scales of food production and, uh, and why the, the defensiveness and the attachment to the word. So yeah. <laughs> there's definitely. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, gendered things attached to the word farmer, which are so interesting. It is really interesting. And it's kind of like that loaded, even if you think about like industrial farming, there's a much more masculine um, connotation to that as well, which it, it is really fascinating, especially when you compare it to the comments that you're getting in the in the comment or in the comment section, I guess, of your other interviews. Um, and it also kind of reminded me of a moment in your introduction where you talked about, um, the Canadian farmerettes, which I found really fascinating as like a word choice. Do you mind kind of sharing what a farmerette was in Canada? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I should have, uh, I shared that. No, what a hilarious word, farmerette. Yeah. Like when I first heard that, I was like, what? Like, it's like kind of dainty and light and like, yeah. you know, farming is, hard backbreaking work and you've got sweat dripping down your brow and like it's not sexy but um <laughs> <laughs> no. uh 
during the during World War One and during, I think the, the the word farmerette was originally originally coined in World War One, but in my book I focus on World War Two because I have the personal connection of my great grandmother Eleanor Moyles, who uh, I guess was a farmerette. She probably wouldn't have called herself a farmerette um, during World War Two. <laughs> who would? When though, let's be real. Ma- who would? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, um, but of course, when uh, a lot of men went off to, to fight in the war, um, just like in, in terms of like women moving into sort of industrial roles or into traditionally male dominated kind of professions at that time to, to, to pick up the slack and to like to fill in, uh, women did the same in terms of agricultural production too. So farmerette was a, was a word that the Canadian government used kind of as propaganda <laughs> way of trying to draw women to rural farms. Um, uh, to you know, to help on orchards, to to drive the tractor, to drive teams of horses, to um, raise livestock, um, and uh, contribute to to agricultural production in Canada, which they're really worried was going to plummet. But it it actually at the time, like um, I don't have the specific numbers right now, but it, it mentions in my book, you know, grain production went up, hog production went up during that time. So it was this real and, and you know who was driving that well that was women like women really stepped up um and uh and yet yeah farmerette so they like there's these really if you google the word you'll find these um posters that pop up at the time um that are you know propaganda and like the women are very sexualized you know like beautiful and like red lips and <laughs> Look, look very dainty look like the word like what a farmerette would look like <laughs> um <laughs> But it was all part of this like marketing strategy to encourage women to to, to pitch in through food uh, and food security. And that actually also, I should say, translated to urban farming, too, because it was one of the first um, uh, examples of institutionalized urban agriculture in Canada that really works and encouraged people to do front yard and backyard gardening, um, canning of vegetables, oh, okay. uh, preserving. So it's all these interesting ways that women were a part of this awesome food security um, initiative during the wartime. That's really cool. And I never really thought about canning or, you know, front gardens or things like that as urban farming, the same way that you think about, like when I, when I picture farming, I think like big open fields and very arduous labor. So it's interesting that they played a role in kind of translating that into smaller and more urbanized spaces as well. Yeah, definitely. Because I mean, collectively, those are, it's like a small output of, of food that's produced, but collectively that can have a huge impact. Um, and and in terms of labor, gardening is really tough work. Like you mm-hmm. talk to anyone who keeps a garden and it's in Canada, it's hard during the summer. Like you have to put in a lot of time irrigating and weeding and, you know, you going away on the weekends and stuff and vacationing. It's really hard to keep your, your garden, um, <laughs> your garden functioning. So it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a kind of labor that's that's uh, um, like overlooked and and probably because it doesn't have an economic output attached to it. I think that that was a trend I found through my book mm. is that um, women's work, and I think this speaks actually more generally too, is that like women's work is often undervalued because we don't have because there aren't price tags attached to it, or a lot of women's work is is unpaid work. Um, and so, you know, just given, you know, our structures, like sometimes that's seen as like, well, maybe it's, you know, it's not a priority or it's, uh, it's, it's not important work. Of course, women's work is hugely important, even if it's unpaid work, um, because, uh, you know, women are the pillars often of their homes or, yeah. or um, communities. So, yeah. Yeah, I like that. And I, I never really think about it as in terms of like, you know, the economic payoffs of women's work are not necessarily recognized the same way. Um, which leads me into my next question. Um, so through your research, uh, what space did you find that feminism held in farming across cultural contexts? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a really interesting question. Um, and I often struggled even in, in <laughs> terms of like sharing my concept for what I was trying to do with women. And I, I realized I, I should stop using the word feminism in some places because um, it immediately, like in terms of, uh, like say a rural context, um, it looks like in, in rural Uganda, for example, um, the word wasn't even necessarily like, it's just not a word people would use in their day-to-day lives. Um, so I wouldn't use that word per se. Uh, 
In in urban Canada, though, for example, like I would say, feminism is playing a huge role in uh, women's involvement in in urban agriculture. The two definitely go hand in hand. Um, I think in rural Canada, though, it's it's not necessarily like I don't know if it's a driving force to women getting involved in agriculture. And in fact, I have, I've noticed there's kind of a cultural reluctance too to be like that women don't want to identify as feminists because maybe uh, some of the more like conservative or especially on the prairies, like some of the more conservative ideals in some farming communities mm-hmm. there may not yet be spaced uh, to understand feminism in that way. There's like a lot of pushback or just sort of like, well, you know, of course, like I'm a woman who has agency, but I don't need to call myself a feminist. And uh, like women farmers who don't, I think maybe fear a little bit of alienating themselves. Um, uh, yeah, so it was interesting in the way that I, I introduced the idea of my research in different places. And I was very, um, I was just, uh, very aware that the fact that, that feminism, um, may not be a word that's like freely used in certain places or really understood in the same way. But as someone who identifies as a feminist, I would say I could see to me what feminism means to me. Like I could see it in action everywhere I went mm-hmm. in terms of the women. Um, really trying to uh, advocate for themselves, for you know, for ac- uh, gaining access to land and land ownership, um, getting their crops to the market, uh, feeding their children, um, pushing back against economic development projects. Like no shortage of examples of women really, I think, fighting and struggling for um, justice on a lot of levels. So I saw feminism in action. It's just interesting sometimes having those more conversations with people about it um like it just it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't necessarily like the like you know like hand you know fist in the air like uh, <laughs> we can do it sort of attitude think, yeah yeah exactly um so it, it differed from place to place but there's still so much conservatism around um around the word and around the theme of it and i think in general like men feeling quite defensive about it and uh and women, in, especially in rural contexts, recognizing that um, there's, there's different pathways to achieving feminism and um, sometimes couldn't speak about it so uh, like explicitly, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's very, I find, um, like I started in archaeology and I found that was a space where I was really reluctant to call myself a feminist because it was such a masculine world for me. So I, I wonder how much male-dominated spaces to this day continue to you know, even if you're operating, as you said, within those sorts of, um, within those sorts of goals or drives without necessarily recognizing it as feminism, how much that is an active or like conscious decision to push because of feminism or to push because you just believe it's right or that's the way to do it. Yeah. And I actually just thought of an example that might be interesting to share is, um, like, I recently, after the book, this was a story didn't uh, end up in the book, but after the book, I interviewed a, a woman who's in a very conservative uh, farming community in central Alberta, which is kind of known as like the Bible Belt. Um, yes. And um, a lot, typically like grain, a lot of grain production um, and larger scale agriculture. And I met a young woman in her early 30s and she was taking over her uh, parents' farm. She'd been doing that for sort of a succession plan for seven years and now the ownership is really in her hands. Um, and she is the first woman in 60 years of her community's um, seed cleaning uh, cooperative board. Um, the first woman in 60 years to serve on that board. Wow. And yeah, just uh, this amazing accomplishment. Um, and, and, but yet she was very reluctant to use the word feminism. Uh, and, you know, and I kind of laughed and I said, well, I was like, well, you know, that's what I would call like mm-hmm. a, 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 like, feminism in action you know like you're really doing it but um you could tell like you know there's a lot of you know cultural things that she's dealing with and um you know it's just the language hasn't really caught up but uh but you see her changing the culture and uh and hopefully changing some of the um ideas around uh or like male ideas or patriarchal ideas around women in leadership because that's uh, a lot of the women i've talked to in canada that's a, a huge thing as well is there's a, a huge discrepancy of um leadership on agricultural boards mm-hmm. and agricultural organizations that do tend to still be dominated by men. And actually I think that's a global, that's a global reality as well too. Um, so yeah, just, just an interesting example about that, I guess. Yeah, that's a really powerful one. And I, I think too, like there's a, sometimes a degree of knowing that you're taking a role 
Um, but you still have to operate within those same circles that you fought so hard to push against. So exactly pushing, but not pushing too, too much. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So I'm really curious about, especially, you know, given the summer and how there's been so much of a focus on climate change and how that's impacting us in terms of day-to-day life, but also farming and subsistence. Um, have you found throughout your travels that climate change has really impacted women farmers in particular? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Hands down. And of course, climate change is affecting, you know, male yeah. and women farmers. But how it differs, I think, is in terms of, again, it's in terms of um, access to resources. And I did on uh, like a general scale that men had more access to education, to um, different forms of farming, to training, to being able to just afford seeds or afford uh, different crops um, to try, you know, to diversify the crops on their land. Um, so, uh, and then, and then I found again, like women were on smaller plots of land, which interestingly though, the, um, United Nations has a food and agriculture organization has said that it's sort of a report, I think in 2013, and it essentially asserts that, um, that small scale agriculture is going to be, uh, the most resilient form, um, to climate change. Oh. So the smaller the scale organic practices, so, um, like uh, the use of uh, synthetic or chemical fertilizers, pesticides can really um, reduce um, soil uh, quality and contribute to soil erosion, whereas organic practices tend to build up um, like organic matter in the soil and which holds uh, holds more water. So it's more drought resistant. So interestingly, <laughs> women may actually be leading sort of um, the scale of agriculture and the kind of agriculture uh, that's going to be the most resilient to climate change. Um, but, uh, the, the disparity in terms of accessing resources is so huge that, um, when, in, you know, if, if you're hit by a hurricane, I can think of, uh, Cuban farmers, um, who I think just recently were hit by another hurricane. And the lady that I interviewed, uh, was hit by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, and fortunately was able to, to access resources to build her property back up and her farm back up, um, but, you know, where's, where's the resources for farmers when they experience a disaster of, you know, that kind of nature, and especially in uh, the global south? Um, uh, you know, it's just really difficult. And I, I've also actually also been with um, migrant farm workers. I, the chapter that was on the U.S. in my book, um, I interviewed women from primarily from Mexico who had um, immigrated into the States, often illegally, so they'd be considered undocumented. Um, to work on um, fruit orchards or uh, vineries, wineries, sorry. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I'm thinking about the, the uh, wildfires in, in California at the yeah. moment. And, and there's often a lot of focus in the media on, um, on farmers and how do you know, these wild, wildfires impacting farmers. But another story is how, how is it impacting migrant farm workers who rely on the wages that they earn daily uh, working in these places? But they're often invisible bodies, right? Like, I mean, these are people who are undocumented. So those are hard stories to tell. Um, but what's the impact um, from the wildfires on 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 uh, the daily wage labor, um, which they completely depend on, and then in turn send that money back to their families that are still remaining in Mexico, who have also been displaced from climate change. Yeah. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, unfortunately. So um, yeah, sadly, I mean, with with the with the changes in the climate, like those issues are only going to continue to grow. Um, I guess uh, the hopeful story is that if it's true, you know, what the United Nations says, that small scale is the way to go, well, then my theory is as women are leading the way, or they're, they're leading that example because that's the type of agriculture that they, generally speaking, tend to do is small scale organic. That's such a fascinating connection. Like, I never would have pieced those two sorts of, um, I don't want to say data sets, but like those two sorts of ideas together because you don't really think about... Um, yeah, again, like especially in North America, you think about farming as a very industrialized and um, almost kind of sterilized process. And you don't think about the ways that that small scale farming can really shape a community and bring people together in a more meaningful way as well. Yeah, and I think especially in Canada, that's the narrative that uh, a lot of female farmers are trying to bring forth into communities is that um, 
you know, like small scale could actually be maybe even more productive than large scale, especially in terms of diversity of what you're producing on one small plot. Like, I mean, industrial agriculture is typically you're growing one or two crops, so it's a monocrop. Um, but on a small scale plot, you've got maybe, you know, maybe you've got 20 crops growing on, on two acres or something. Plus, wow. uh, you know, you've got um, maybe like chicken and egg production or like goat milk. Um, so it's small tends to be a little bit more integrated where you've got more production habit, more production happening. It's just on a smaller plot of land. So um, I really see women championing that in, in North America right now. Um, and then you see that happening globally too. Like, I mean, like small scale plots that, that women have, and they're not necessarily making a lot of money or economic output from mm-hmm. what they're growing, but, um, but it's the most resilient for, for food security and for climate change as well too. So again, it's that, that question around what do we do? If we just tend to look at, um, economic output for what's method forward, well, then we're really not, <laughs> we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah. Because, um, the largest story is, you know, we got to consider all these other factors like climate change and health of children, health of the elderly. Um, and so the way women are doing it on small scale with more diverse kind of production happening to me is, is will create healthier communities. All right. So I wanted to move a little bit into the struggle side of things. So thinking about farming is very arduous, very backbreaking, not so much a farmerette sort of situation. Um, did women, <laughs> did you find that, that women were very forthcoming about the struggles related to their farming? Um, or did they discuss how they coped with harder periods, whether it be seasonally or annually, or was that more of a like, you know, taboo subject to approach? No, it was the first thing that they would talk about is the struggle. Like <laughs> <laughs> I often laugh to my friends that I realized as I was like thick in the research, that the stories, I actually worried that my book would be perceived as too negative because really? it was so focused on the issues. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I had someone very close to me in the book publishing world who said just it said exactly that, you know, like she actually read my chapter on the U.S. migrant farm work workers and said, you know, like this might, you know, book publishers may not like this. They may see this as too much of a downer. And 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 I, I stayed true to the interviews because what I found through the interview process is that was the first thing women wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about how they were struggling. They wanted to talk about how they were, what they were up against, whether that was like a gold mining company operating illegally on their ancestral land in Guatemala. Wow. <laughs> Or, um, you know, or access to land or um, the cost of land. A lot of women in Canada, that's the first thing they would talk about is they wanted to expand their operations, but they just can't afford it. Mm. Because land has gone up so much from, you know, um, oil and, uh, you know, commercial development and residential development. Um, So they just can't compete. Um, Or, you know, one wants to go into debt uh, for farming because it's such a lucrative business yeah um uh so the issues were the first things that came up um i even had one like canadian uh, farmer and she's a urban urban farmer and she like gosh what did she say but uh she told me she went to, to this like um uh, school to talk about what she did and and how you know people could you know do what she does and and she she left feeling quite embarrassed because she <laughs> She realized that they, they're probably like, I'll never do that based on everything you just told me and how difficult it is. Oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely backbreaking and it's bank breaking too. It's just so economically hard to be a farmer these days. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they call it the disappearing middle, like middle sized farms are, are disappearing. Whereas, um, you know, the larger farms, like the trend is like that farms continue to get bigger in Canada. Um, uh, but then there's also this incredible niche of of uh, small scale farms, and that's again where like a lot of women are getting involved. But the issues were the, was the first place the conversations was usually directed. Um, but then I would also find like that uh, women love the lifestyle; they love you know that they're if they have families, like well, their kids get to be involved in growing yeah. food, and you know they get to be in rural settings, they get to be outside of cities. Um, there's a sense of community often in rural uh, rural communities. It's really, really strong, right? You've got to take care of each other. Um, I found that, you know, um, from country to country, that, that idea existed of sort of community support and um, relying on each other in hard times. Um, in terms of, like, the, the economic struggle, I found 
one Canadian farmer I talked to, you know, she was just really feeling the desire, like, the, or not the desire, but like the pressure, societal pressure to go bigger, maybe, you know, mm. to be taken seriously. Or she was seeing other farmers who just had more land than her. So she said she actually tried to do the same thing. And it kind of drove her into the ground because it was so time consuming and exhausting. And she kind of broke down and stepped away from the farm, was going to give it up entirely, and then realized she did want to be a farmer. She just and in her words, she said that she just wanted to do it on her own terms. So um, she uh, innovated by focusing on uh, microgreens. And, um, oh, cool. She was, yeah, she was able to grow microgreens year-round, um, so even in the wintertime, too, um, inside under grow lights. And it was a lot less physically demanding. Um, it filled a niche in the Edmonton market. Um, and she was one of the first, actually, uh, microgreen farmers in, the, in uh, Edmonton. This was obviously like 10 Amazing. years ago, and and uh, she taught herself how to do it. And again, she was like, this is before YouTube. You know, you can learn everything on YouTube now. <laughs> <laughs> so she did the real she thing. She learned from, <laughs> yeah, she did the real thing just from experimentation, and and it worked for her. Um, so by, in fact, by going smaller, it actually had a bigger economic output for her. Um, and then just, you know, it was, it, she was able to live like a more healthy um, uh, lifestyle. Um, and then in Uganda, one thing I saw was that women – during the dry season when they weren't able to, to grow like so lacking in like groundwater irrigation systems. And so all of the agriculture is, is reliant on, on rain. So during the three months dry season, women would organize themselves and uh, weave baskets, baskets. So they created like a women's basket uh, weaving cooperative and then would sell cool. those as a way to generate income. So definitely saw examples of women, you know, coping and working around the, the more difficult seasons, uh, whether that was like the weather or um, whatever sort of challenge up against. So yeah, there's no shortage of, of ways that women were resilient at times. And um, yeah, again, like that pride, like women were just so hugely proud about their work, um, no matter the, no matter the, um, the challenge they're up against. That's really beautiful. Um, so one thing I'm really interested in is the idea of ecofeminism. So the connection between like environment and environmental harm or like care and, um, and like females in particular, uh, did you find that, uh, did you find examples of ecofeminism at all in your work? Particularly, I know like Vandana Shiva speaks a lot about that. So I'm wondering in India in particular, was there a lot of, um, prominent, day-to-day examples of ecofeminism or was it kind of not so much focused on there? I think that's where I wanted to take my book. That's the, those are the stories I wanted to capture. Um, and sadly, those were not really the stories I encountered, to be uh-huh. honest. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. And I think that's where I thought like, Oh my book is going to be too negative. You know, it's, I, I wanted to capture all these empowering examples. Then it, it became clear to me too, that I also wanted to stay true to my process. Like yeah. I, I wanted to write about, as opposed to like going to communities where I knew these examples existed, um, and I possibly could have done that, and I, I, I didn't lack of resources and and time, and <laughs> and then also I found that the stories I encountered, you know, in places where those things were quite difficult, that those are also stories that need to be told, um, as opposed to just uh, talking about the success stories. So I didn't find that in India, to be honest. I. I I would say it was uh, one of the most patriarchal places, particular oh, community wow. in southern India that I went, um, uh, and it was a place where there's a, a huge practice of um, uh, female infanticide, mm. um, and um, that just I mean like like how <laughs> what's a more harsh example that you need of of, of of showing patriarchy in action is you know not prioritizing female infants like it's yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. You know, and and fortunately, that practice is becoming less um, less of an issue. And you can also see how it was really driven, not necessarily by what people wanted, but by economic circumstances of not being able to afford to marry their daughters and pay for a dowry um, to marry their daughters into another family, which was really sort of the, the economic thing that was driving that practice, not inherently because uh, people don't like women or girls, but um, yeah. because of the economic hardships that these very, very economically poor farmers were facing. Um, there's still like some residual sort of, um, I guess, impact of that that I, I saw in, in, in the communities and families that I interviewed there. 
Um, and even it just my own personal experience of being there was quite frustrating, um, working with male translators and knowing I was not necessarily because I, I didn't speak the local language. So it was, like, I often felt like I wasn't getting the content that uh, um, women were wanting to share with me or that it just was set up sort of inappropriately that like it just wasn't a safe space for women to be honest about certain things. So it created a lot of interesting dynamics for me to to kind of navigate and negotiate with. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But but it was a bit of a bubble breaker. Like I I wanted to find those powerful examples of ecofeminism in action, and I I didn't see it. But I I I think some of the stories we want to tell, and those are the stories we want to hear, and they're the ones we want to share. But I think more realistically, what's happening out there. In, in different communities is that especially rural communities where, you know, there's all sorts of social issues and lack of education, lack of access into certain professions. A lot of the women, in fact, I met didn't want their daughters to become farmers. Mm-hmm. And that was very powerful for me in a big wake up call um, that it's easy to romanticize the land and women um, for all sorts of beautiful reasons. Um, and I do think there's a sort of this natural synergy between like the feminine and and the earth um there's all sorts of parallels but unfortunately you know we all operate under economic mm-hmm. and political structures that are often you know out of our control um especially where markets are concerned um or access to resources or access to justice and uh like a lot of the women would never want their daughters to be farmers because it's just too hard um so i met a young woman and she actually became my translator which was really cool she was sitting in on a on a uh, um, a women's uh, discussion or group interview that I did. And she came up to me afterwards and her English was really terrific. And I'd been working with a male translator and and I actually said, you know, can I hire you? I hired her right on the spot. And she came and did some individual interviews for me. Um, but she wanted to be a farmer and her parents said, no, they said, um, you should, uh, you know, go to school for engineering or something that's where you're actually going to get a job as opposed to farming. So wow. it did, it, kind of broke the romantic bubble I had about that. That's not to say that it, it doesn't exist or there isn't that like natural parallel there between the feminine and um, and food production. Uh, it's just that, you know, how common is that? How common are those examples? I guess that maybe be another book to focus on. <laughs> yeah, some seeds for yeah. you. But I think I really yeah. admire your ability to take the story as it is and present it as, you know, an organic and natural, like this is exactly what's going on. And weaving that narrative in, but not, I think in anthropology a lot, you get really um, attached to ideas or like these beautiful theories like ecofeminism or things like that. And you don't really think about the realities or how realities are constantly changing. So I love that you were able to just be very real about that situation and or the other farming communities that you're in without, you know, you still pay tribute to the love and the respect and the resiliency of these women, but also the hardships, which is a very hard balance to strike, I'd imagine, as a writer. Yeah, it, it definitely was like very ethically kind of problematic for me to <laughs> to to negotiate sometimes in the writing and and through the publishing process. And I still have some mixed feelings about certain themes that I decided to highlight over others. But um, but thanks. Yeah, I know I, I definitely wanted to stay true to um, to the issues because, like I said, those that that was often the first thing that women talked to me about was what was hard about being a farmer. And then they would get into like what they loved about it. (laughs) Yeah. I also kind of feel like that speaks to humanity though. Like we tend to bond over things that are difficult and then we become friends afterwards, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Okay. So we're going to start winding down a little bit, but before we go, um, do you have any upcoming projects that you're working on that you would like to share with listeners at all? Yeah, absolutely. Well, right now, like doing this phone interview, I am up 100 feet up in the sky in a fire tower in northwestern Alberta. Um, so I've been working seasonally for the past three years to support my work as a writer, <laughs> um, as a fire tower lookout. That's and, so cool. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just looking out of this beautiful... Well, it's not really beautiful. It, it is like like aesthetically beautiful, this uh, fire sun right now, like the sun is setting and it's this wow. bright neon fuchsia color unfortunately i've been (laughs) the downside of that is i've been smoked in um for the past three weeks from all the wildfires that are burning out of control in british columbia right now and the smoke is blowing across the border um so i'm working on a a book 
right now um, about my personal experience of coming out here to work in a fire tower, but it's also, I think, a commentary on um, uh, the increasing prevalence of wildfires uh, worldwide and issues of smoke, who owns smoke mm. from wildfires, who's responsible sort of interesting questions that we're going to continue to face as a society based on climate change and uh, just the management of forests in Canada over the past, really over the past century and how it's led to incredibly um, dry forests that are are really seething out of control. So, yeah, so I'm working on that book. Um, I haven't found a publisher yet, but um, hopefully we'll be able to to find someone to take that story on. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like that's such a fascinating, it's also a very important, particularly in Canada right now, like that story is, I think more and more people are becoming aware of the prevalence of forest fires here. And I think the idea of ownership of smoke is very fascinating. Yeah, there's so many interesting stories that are spawning out of this project, I realize. I think whenever you're working on a book, you probably feel this too with the research you've done in anthropology. Like, there's just always more questions. Yeah. And yes. <laughs> you're like, this could actually be like three books. But. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah. And then uh, actually, yeah, and then I'd encourage people if they're interested to, I do have some events um, coming up in the fall and spring of 2019. Okay. Um, so if want to visit my website it's womenwhodig.com and I've got an events page and I'll have events coming up in Vancouver and Edmonton um Halifax and Toronto so nice. um yeah just through the help of like different organizations and people who are interested in in, in women who dig I've been able to kind of line up some events uh, across the country and um yeah and share the stories with with communities there Fantastic. Uh, okay, so you mentioned your website, but uh, so for people who want to learn a little bit more about you, uh, where else can we find you online to learn a little bit more about you? Yeah, um, you can visit my personal website, which is trinamoyles.com. Um, and then I'm on Instagram as uh, uh, the handle at women who dig. Um, I do post about my life at the fire tower on there as well, um, cool. which is funny because Sometimes I'll, I'll go to book events and people don't even want to talk about women who dig. They want to talk oh. about the fire, fire tower. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like the more interesting thing about me. <laughs> um, and uh, and then I'm also on, I have like an author page on Facebook as well, too. So you can find me at uh, Trina Moyles. Um, and uh, I'm not like the most social media savvy person. <laughs> because who is if you choose? I know, um, it's so overwhelming. Tower. Yeah, it really is. So so important. I'm trying to get better at it, but um, <laughs> but I, I try. I dabble. I'm like a, like a weekly poster kind of person. So, Fair. I feel you. Um, stay in touch that way. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, Trina, thank you so much for joining me on Anthrodish. I really enjoyed getting to talk to you and learn more or learning more about your book. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I I, uh, I really appreciate it, and I love what you're doing with the show as well. Oh, thank you. That's sweet. <laughs> That was Trina Moyles, award-winning journalist and author of the newly published Woman Who Dig, Farming, Feminism, and the Fight to Feed the World. You can find her book on Amazon or at any major bookseller near you, and I highly recommend going to go get it. I've read it, and it is truly such a beautiful and powerful look at farming. And it's laced with these amazing photographs of some of the women that she has worked with over the years. If you'd like to learn more about Trina or her writing, check out her website, trinamoyles.com, or womanwhodig.com for more on her book. If you want to get social, you can find her at Twitter and Facebook at Trina Moyles or on Instagram at womenwhodig. And Anthrodish got a new website, so go check us out at anthrodish.com to access some of the resources that Trina provided, along with all of the links to her website and her social pages and lots of other great resources for you. And you can see some of the photos that uh, Trina took during her travels and research find it all under the episodes. Thanks so much for listening to Anthrodish. We will see you next time.